Hello, everybody, and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit 2020. We're tracking the rise of the data cloud and fresh off the keynotes here, Frank Slootman, the chairman and CEO of Snowflake and Anita Lynch, the vice president of data governance at Disney Streaming Services. Folks, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Dave. I need a Disney Plus, awesome. You know, we signed up early, watched all the Marvel movies, Hamilton, the new Pixar movie, Soul. I haven't gotten into the Mandalorian yet, your favorite, but uh, really appreciate you guys coming on. Let me start with, with, with Frank. I'm, I'm glad you're putting forth this vision around the data cloud because I never liked the term enterprise data warehouse. What you're doing is, is so different from the sort of that legacy world that I've known all these years, but start with why the data cloud, what problems are you trying to solve and, and maybe some of the harder challenges you're seeing? Yeah, no, you know, we have, uh, we've come a long way in terms of workload execution, right? In terms of scale and performance and, and uh, you know, concurrent execution, we've really taken the lid off sort of the physical constraints that, that have existed on these type of operations, but there's one problem uh, that we're not yet uh, solving, and that is the siloing and bunkering of data. And essentially, you know, data is locked in applications, it's locked in data centers, it's locked in cloud, cloud regions. Uh, incredibly hard for, for data science teams to really you know, unlock the true value of data when you, you, when you can't address patterns that, that exist across uh, data sets. So we're, we're perpetuate uh, a status we've had for forever since the beginning uh, uh, of computing if we don't start to, to, to crack that problem now, we have that opportunity. But the notion of a data cloud is like basically saying, look folks, you know, we, we have to start unsiloing and unlocking the data um, and, and bring it into a place, you know, where we can access it, uh, you know, across all these parameters and boundaries that have uh, historically existed. It's, it's very much a step level function. Uh, customers have always uh, looked at things one workload at a time that mentality really has to go. You really have to have a data cloud mentality as well as a workload orientation towards, uh, towards managing data. Yeah. Anita, it was great hearing your role at Disney and your, your keynote and the work you're doing, uh, the, the governance work, and you're, you're serving a great number of stakeholders, enabling things like data sharing. You got really laser focused on trust, compliance, privacy. And this idea of a data clean room is really interesting. Yeah, you know, maybe you can expand on, on some of these initiatives here and, and share what you're seeing as some of the biggest challenges to success and of course the opportunities that you're unlocking. Sure, I mean, in my role leading data governance, it's really critical to make sure that all of our stakeholders not only know what data is available and accessible to them, they can also understand really easily and quickly whether or not the data that they're using is for the appropriate use case. And so, that's a big part of how we scale data governance. And a lot of the work that we would normally have to do manually is actually done for us through the data clean rooms. Thank you for that. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the role of, of data and how your data strategy has evolved and, and maybe discuss some of the things that, that Frank mentioned about data silos. And I mean, obviously you can relate to that having been in the data business for a while, but I wonder if you could elucidate on that. Sure. I mean, data complexities are going to evolve over time in any traditional data architecture, simply because you often have different teams at different periods in time trying to analyze and gather data across a whole lot of different sources. And the complexity that just arises out of that is due to the different needs of specific stakeholders, their time constraints, and quite often, um, it's not always clear how much value they're going to be able to extract from the data at the outset. So what we've tried to do to help break down those silos is allow individuals to see upfront how much value they're going to get from the data by knowing that it's trustworthy right away, by knowing that it's something that they can use in their specific use case right away, and by ensuring that essentially as they're continuing to kind of scale the, the, the use cases that they're focused on, they're no longer required to uh, make multiple copies of the data, do multiple steps to reprocess the data. And that makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, for sure, I mean, copy creep because it'd be a silent killer. Frank, yeah. I've I, I followed you for a number of years. You know, you've, you've, you're a big thinker. You and I have had a lot of conversations about the, the near term, midterm and long term. I, I wonder if you could talk about, you know, in your keynote, you talk about eliminating silos and, and connecting across data sources. 
which is a really powerful concept, but it really only if people are willing and able to connect and collaborate. Where do you see that happening? Maybe what are some of the, the blockers there? Well, there's, there's certainly a, a natural friction there. Um, I still remember when we first started to talk to to Salesforce, uh, you know, they had uh, discovered that we were uh, a top three destination of Salesforce data, and they were wondering, um, you know, why that was. And, and the reason is, of course, that people take Salesforce data, push it to Snowflake because they want to overlay it with with data outside of Salesforce. You know, whether it's Adobe or any other type of marketing data set, and then they want to run very highly scaled processes, you know, on it. But the, the reflexes uh, in, in the world of SaaS is always like, no, we're, we're an island, we're a planet unto ourselves. Everybody needs to come with us as opposed to we, we go you know, to a different platform to run these type of processes. It's no different for the, uh, for the public cloud vendor. They, they, I mean, they have you know, massive moats around their, uh, you know, their storage to, you know, to really prevent data from, from leaving their, their orbit. Um, so there is natural friction in, uh, in, in terms of for this to happen. But, on the other hand, you know, there is an enormous need. You know, we, we can't deliver on, on the power and potential of data unless we allow it to come together. Uh, Snowflake is the platform that allows that to happen. Um, you know, we were pleased with our relationship with Salesforce because they did uh, uh, appreciate, you know, why this was important and why this was necessary. And we think, you know, other parts of the industry will, will gradually come around to it as well. So the, the idea of a data cloud has really come, right? Uh, people are, are recognizing, you know, why this this matters. Now, it's not going to happen overnight. It is a step level function, a very big change in, in mentality and orientation. You know. Yeah, it's almost as though the the sassification of our industry sort of repeated some of the the application silos and you build a hardened top around it. All the processes are hardened around it, and okay, here we go. And you're really trying to break that, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, Anita. Again, I want to come back to this notion of governance. It's so, it's so important. It's the you know, first role in your title and it really underscores the importance of this. Um, you know, Frank was just talking about some of the hurdles and, and this is, this is a, a, a big one. I mean, we saw this in the early days of big data where governance was this afterthought. It was like bolted on, <laughs> kind of wild, wild west. I, I'm interested in your governance journey and maybe you can share a little bit about what role Snowflake has, has played there in terms of supporting that agenda and, and kind of what's next on that journey. Sure, well, you know, I've, I've led data teams in, a numerous, uh, in numerous ways over my career. This is the first time that I've actually had the opportunity to focus on governance. And what it's done is allowed for my organization to scale much more rapidly. And that's so critically important for our overall strategy as a company. Well, I mean, a big part of what you were talking about, at least my inference in your, your, your talk was really that the business folks didn't have to care about, you know, wonder about, they cared about it, but they didn't have to wonder about and, and, and about the privacy concerns, et cetera. You've taken care of all that. It's sort of transparent to them. Is that yeah, that's, right? Yeah, that's right, absolutely. So we focus on ensuring compliance across all of the different regions where we operate. We also partner very heavily with our legal and information security teams. They're critical to ensuring you know, that we're able to, to do this. We don't, we don't do it alone. But governance includes not just you know, the compliance and, and the privacy, it's also about data access, and it's also about ensuring data quality. And so all of that comes together under the governance umbrella. I also lead teams that focus on things like instrumentation, which is how we collect data. We focus on um, the infrastructure and making sure that we've architected for scale. And all of these are really important components of our strategy. I got a, so I have a question maybe each of you can answer. I, I sort of see this, the, our industry moving from you know, products to then to platforms and platforms even evolving into ecosystems. And then there's this ecosystem of of data, you guys both talked a lot about data sharing, but but maybe Frank, you can start, and Anita, you can add on to Frank's answer. You're obviously both pa both passionate about the use of, of data and trying to do so in a responsible way. That's critical, but it's also got to have business impact. Frank, where's this passion come from on your side, and how are you putting into to action in your own organization? Well, you know, I'm really going to date myself here, but you know, uh, many many years ago, um, you know. I saw the first glimpse of uh, multidimensional databases that were used for reporting really on, on, on IBM mainframes. 
Um, and it was extraordinarily difficult. We didn't even have the words back then in terms of data warehouses and business. All these terms didn't exist. People just knew that they wanted to have a more flexible you know, way of reporting and being able to, to pivot data uh, dimensionally and all these kinds of things. And I just, by the way, this predates you know, Windows 3.1, which really you know, set off the whole sort of graphical you know, way of dealing with systems, which there's now whole generations of people that don't know any different, right? So I, I've lived the, the, the pain uh, of this problem uh, and, and sort of been had a front row seat to watching this, this transpire over a very long period of time. And that's, that's one of the reasons um, you know, why I'm here, because I finally seen you know, a glimpse of you know, us as an industry fully, fully just unleashing and unlocking the potential. We're now in a place where the technology is ahead of people's ability to harness it, right? Which we've, we've never been there before, right? It was always like we wanted to do things the technology wouldn't let us. It's different now. I mean, people are just, their heads are spinning with what's now possible, which is why you see markets evolve, you know, very rapidly right now. We, we, we were talking earlier about how you can't take, you know, past definitions and concepts and apply them to what's going on in the world. The world's changing right in front of your eyes right now. So Anita, maybe you could uh, add on to what Frank just said and, and share some of the business impacts and, and outcomes that are notable since you've really applied your, your love of data and, and maybe, maybe touch on, on culture, your data culture. Uh, you know, any words of wisdom for folks in the audience who might be thinking about embarking on a data cloud journey similar to what you've been on? Yeah, sure. I think for me, I fell in love with technology first, and then I fell in love with data. And I fell in love with data because of the impact that data can have on both the business and the technology strategy. And so it's sort of that nexus you know, between all three. And in terms of my career journey and, and some of the impacts that I've seen, I mean, I think with the advent of the cloud, you know, before, well, how do I say this? Before the cloud actually became you know, so prevalent and such a common part of, of the strategy that's required. It was so difficult, you know, so painful. It took so many hours to actually be able to calculate, you know, the volumes of data that we had. Now we have that accessibility. And then on top of it with the Snowflake Data Cloud, it's much more uh, performance oriented from a cost perspective because you don't have multiple copies of the data, or at least you don't have to have multiple copies of the data. And I think moving beyond some of the traditional mechanisms for, um, for measuring business impact has, uh, has only been possible with the volumes of data that we have available to us today. And it's just, it's phenomenal to see the speed at which we can operate and really truly understand our customers' interests and their preferences, and then tailor the experiences that they really want and deserve for them. Uh, it's, it's been a great feeling to, to get to this point in time. That's fantastic. Hey, so Frank, I got to ask you, so in your spare time, you decided to write a book. I'm, I'm loving it. Um, I don't have a signed copy, so you, I'm going to have to send it back and have you sign it. But, um, and you're, you're, I love the inside baseball. It's just awesome. Uh, so really appreciate that. So, but why did you decide to write a book? Well, there, there, there were a couple of reasons. Obviously, uh, we thought it was an interesting tale to tell for anybody you know, who was interested in you know, what's going on, how did this come about, you know, who are the characters behind the scenes and all this kind of stuff. But uh, you know, from a business standpoint, um, you know, because this is such a step function, it's so non-incremental. Uh, we felt like you know we really needed quite a bit of real estate to really lay out what the full narrative and context is, um, and you know we thought you know the book's titled "The Rise of the Data Cloud." That's exactly what it is, and uh, we're, we're trying to make the case for that that mindset, that mentality, that strategy, uh, because otherwise, you know, I think as an industry, we're, we're at risk uh, of you know persisting perpetuating um, you know, where we've been since the beginning of, uh, of computing. So we're, we're, we're really trying to make a pretty forceful case for, look, you know, there's an enormous opportunity out there, but there's some choices you have to make along the way. Guys, we got to leave it there. Frank, I know you and I are going to talk again. Anita, I hope we have a chance to meet face-to-face -face and, and talk in the Cube live someday. You're a phenomenal guest and what a great story. Thank you both for coming on. And thank you for watching. Keep it right there. You're watching the Snowflake Data Cloud Summit on the Cube.